The following is a presentation of Tomorrow's World. The biblical prophet Ezekiel was given what would appear on the surface to be one of the strangest commissions ever given. Take a message to a people he would never see and do so at a time long after his death, about 2,600 years in the future. Yet we are told that he would be accountable for doing so. How would that be possible? Ezekiel is one of the largest books contained in the Bible, but few today, even few professing Christians, have any understanding of this mysterious book because they don't have two keys that unlock it. Those two keys will be given to you on today's program. You can understand the message, and believe it or not, you can have a part in carrying that message to the people for whom it was intended. In that sense, you can help fulfill prophecy. And if you'd like to know how, stay tuned. A warm and special welcome to all of you from Tomorrow's World. Few today, even among professing Christians, have any understanding of the biblical book of Ezekiel. Few have even read it, yet Ezekiel's message touches every one of you who are viewing this program, and it will become even more relevant in the days and years ahead. Ezekiel was a young Jew when his city was defeated by the Chaldeans around 597 B.C., after which he was taken to Babylon. It was during his captivity that he was given a series of messages to record, but there is something mysterious about these messages. We read in the closing verses of chapter 2 that Ezekiel was to eat a prophetic scroll that contained bad and painful news. He was then to take his message to a certain people, and here we come to the first key that unlocks this mysterious book. Ezekiel's message was for the house of Israel. It's really that simple. Here it is in chapter 3 and verse 1. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find, eat this scroll, and go speak to the house of Israel. Most people who read the book, and let's be honest, that's an ever-shrinking percentage of the population, think that Ezekiel wrote for the benefit of the Jews of his day. This assumption is an error, and here's why. The Jewish nation went into captivity to the Chaldean or Babylonian Empire in three waves. Ezekiel was deported in the second wave, and he speaks of the fall of Jerusalem, which would take place in the third and final wave. However, as we have just read, he was to take the message and, quote, go to the house of Israel. Most people wrongly assume this means the Jews. And it's true that Jews are Israelites, but did you know that most Israelites are not Jews? This is critically important, and the implications for you and me are immense. Those who are familiar with the Bible have heard of the patriarch Abraham. Abraham had a son named Isaac, and Isaac had a son named Jacob. Three names, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But God changed Jacob's name to Israel. So Israel, who is sometimes referred to in Scripture by his original name of Jacob, was the grandson of Abraham. And to Abraham were given some truly amazing promises that are even now being fulfilled before our eyes. Abraham and his descendants were promised great national wealth and possessions. They were to spread abroad to the north, the east, the south, and the west. They were to possess the gates of their enemies and have great military power. But these promises were not so much for their time as they were for a time long into the future. Most students of the Bible are familiar with the promise of the ruler to come, 
in which all nations of the earth would be blessed. And that, of course, was Jesus the Christ. But few realize the physical aspects of the promises made to Abraham and his descendants. There is far more on this subject than we have time to cover on this program, but it's all contained in the booklet we are offering today, The United States and Great Britain in Prophecy. Be sure to have writing material available to take down our contact information that will be shown shortly. Here's a little of what God promised Abraham's grandson in Genesis, the 35th chapter, verses 10 and 11. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Also God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. Israel lived up to the command to be fruitful and multiply as he had 12 sons. One was named Judah, and he is the father of the Jews. Another son was named Joseph, and while Joseph's descendants are Israelites, descendants of the man named Israel, they did not descend from the Jews and are therefore not Jews. Here's a simple way to understand this. Nova Scotia is one of 10 Canadian provinces. We might rightfully say that Nova Scotians are Canadians, but not all Canadians are Nova Scotians, not by a long shot. In the same way, Jews are Israelites, descendants of the man Israel, but the majority of Israel's descendants are not Jews. A simple lack of understanding of this biblical and historical fact has locked Ezekiel's message to understanding. Why is it that you have very likely never been taught this basic biblical truth? And why am I making such a big deal over something that may superficially not seem important? The answers to these questions may shock you. I'll explain in a moment but first I want to offer you our absolutely free booklet, The United States and Great Britain in Prophecy. This booklet will open your eyes as nothing else can of what is happening in our world that seems to be unraveling before our eyes. You need this booklet if you want to understand our world. So far I've introduced you to our first key, but when I come back I'll explain it more fully and give you the second key to unlocking the mysterious book of Ezekiel. But first, take down the contact information to order your free copy of The United States and Great Britain in Prophecy. It will literally open your eyes to current events and what to expect in the near future. So please, for your well-being, follow the contact information to obtain your absolutely free copy of the United States and Great Britain in Prophecy. For today's free informative offer, send your request to Tomorrow's World, P.O. Box 3800, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28227, or call this toll-free number, 1-800-236-0531. That number again is 1-800-236-0531. With this offer, you will also receive your free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine, full of timely articles and unique insights on today's important issues. Tomorrow's World magazine keeps you up to date with world trends, Bible prophecy, and the very meaning of life itself. Tomorrow's World, call now. In the previous section of today's program, we were reviewing the fact that all Israelites are not Jews. But why is this so important? One of Israel's sons was sold into slavery by his brothers, and they led their father to believe that Joseph was killed by a wild animal. Joseph's family was reunited 15 years later in Egypt, and Israel was now advanced in age. We can only imagine the emotions that welled up in Israel when he discovered that Joseph was alive. 
Sometime after their reunion in Egypt, Israel prophesied what would become of his 12 sons at the end of the age. And those prophecies are coming alive before our very eyes. Notice in Genesis, the 49th chapter, beginning in verse 1. And Jacob, or Israel, called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. We don't have time to read what was prophesied for each son, but one is of particular interest for this program. The descendants of Israel's son Joseph were to inherit great amounts of territory, incredible mineral wealth, unmatched agricultural riches, and God-given military power to defend against all aggressors. Here's a portion of Israel's prediction for Joseph's descendants, Genesis 49, beginning in verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. But his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob, by the God of your father who will help you, and by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breast and of the womb, up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph." The promises to Israel's sons were twofold. The promised Messiah was to come from the son known as Judah, but the physical birthright blessings were to be passed down not through the Jews, but through Joseph. Here it is in 1 Chronicles, the fifth chapter, beginning in verse 1. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, he was indeed the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that the genealogy is not listed according to the birthright. Yet Judah prevailed over his brothers, and from him came a ruler, although the birthright was Joseph's. The ruler to come through the Jews is, of course, Jesus Christ. But the birthright blessings would go to the sons of Joseph. Joseph had two sons, and in a little-known passage of Genesis, the 48th chapter, Israel adopted and passed on his name to his grandsons, Manasseh and Ephraim. He also passed the birthright blessings directly to them. But something unusual happened in the process. Israel gave the greater blessing to the younger son and the lesser blessing to Joseph's firstborn. These blessings were passed on to them when Israel laid his hands on them, but instead of placing his right hand, which symbolized the greater blessing on the firstborn, he crossed his hands, giving Ephraim the greater blessing. We pick up Joseph's protest in Genesis, the 48th chapter, and verses 18 and 19. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So we now learn that the prophesied single great nation that we read of earlier would go to Manasseh. But the company or commonwealth of nations would go to Ephraim. In the course of time, all of Israel's sons, including his two adopted sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, increased in numbers, but they became enslaved in Egypt. God used a man named Moses to lead them out of Egypt, and they eventually became a significant Middle Eastern power under such kings as David and Solomon. But due to Solomon's sins, the nation became divided at the beginning of the reign of his son Rehoboam. From that time on, the children of Israel were divided into two nations, known as the house of Judah, that is the Jews, along with the children of Benjamin and many Levites, and the house of Israel, the other ten tribes. These are not to be confused with the company of nations that would come from Ephraim, 
and the great nation that would come from Manasseh. Their descendants were only a part of the nation known as the House of Israel. And Israel and Judah were never again united. They remain separate to this very day. The books of 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles attest to the separate histories of these nations. This brings us back to our first key to understanding Ezekiel's prophecies. As we have already seen, Ezekiel's message was to be taken not to the Jews, but to the house of Israel, the other ten tribes. Ezekiel is instructed six times in the third chapter that he was to prophesy to the house of Israel. What is strange about this is that Ezekiel was only able to take God's message to his own people, captives of the house of Judah. Yet his commission was to be a watchman for the house of Israel, as seen in chapter 3 and in verse 17. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. It's a fair question to ask whether Ezekiel was confused about these two nations. After all, most people think of Jews and Israel as being synonymous. The next chapter of Ezekiel is most intriguing. Surprisingly, this may be the only portion of Ezekiel that many people have ever read. In the United States and Canada, you can find on the grocery shelf something called Ezekiel bread. And on the label, it refers to Ezekiel 4, verse 9. The prophet was told to, Also take for yourself wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, and spelt. Put them into one vessel and make bread of them for yourself. While people may be familiar with this type of bread, they have no idea of its context. What does so-called Ezekiel bread have to do with his mysterious message? I'll answer that question in a moment, but first I want to give you another chance to order your free copy of the United States and Great Britain in Prophecy. Without the knowledge contained in this booklet, it is impossible to truly understand the world in which we live. So write down the contact information. Go to your phone or computer and order your own free copy of this most important booklet, The United States and Great Britain in Prophecy. For today's free informative offer, send your request to Tomorrow's World, P.O. Box 3800, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28227. Or call this toll-free number, 1-800-236-0531. That number again is 1-800-236-0531. With this offer, you will also receive your free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine, full of timely articles and unique insights on today's important issues. Tomorrow's World Magazine keeps you up to date with world trends, Bible prophecy, and the very meaning of life itself. Tomorrow's World, call now. What does a type of bread found in the book of Ezekiel have to do with you? I grew up at the end of World War II, and one of my friends and I would sometimes play with small plastic soldiers. We placed these miniature soldiers behind rocks and mounds, and then we would proceed to knock off our opponent's soldiers with rubber bands. Every time I read Ezekiel 4, I'm reminded of this, and here's why. Ezekiel was told to portray the city of Jerusalem on a clay tablet. Then beginning in verse 2, he is instructed to lay siege against it, build a siege wall against it, and heap up a mound against it, Set camps against it also, and place battering rams against it all around, and you shall lay siege against it. Why such a strange thing for a grown man to do? Why was he to portray, as with a child's game, the siege of Jerusalem? Remember that Ezekiel was a captive in Babylon. Many of his countrymen were there with him, 
But the city of Jerusalem was still holding out against the mighty Chaldean Empire. Ezekiel was portraying what would happen to the city of Jerusalem in a few short years. But this is only a small part of the story. The last part of verse 3 makes a startling revelation that nearly everyone reads right over. This will be a sign to the house of Israel. The destruction of Jerusalem was to be a sign to the house of Israel. In spite of this clear statement and others that we have already read, commentators still believe Ezekiel's message was to the Jews. But even if these so-called scholars don't know the difference, Ezekiel did. Verses 4 through 6 prove this. Here he is told to lie also on your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of days that you lie on it, you shall bear their iniquity. For I have laid on you the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days, 390 days. So you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. He was then told to lie on his other side to bear the iniquity of the house of Judah, otherwise known as the Jews. And when you have completed them, lie again on your right side. Then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have laid on you a day for each year. And what about so-called Ezekiel bread? As we learn in verse 9, he was to eat bread made with these special ingredients for a duration of 390 days. So while people know about Ezekiel bread, they know nothing about Ezekiel's message and how this passage demonstrates that Ezekiel's message was to be taken to a different people than the Jews. This is our first key to understanding Ezekiel's mysterious prophecies. Ezekiel's message was for the house of Israel. This does not mean that he wasn't to warn the Jews. He was. But his primary focus or commission was to Israel, not Judah. So what is so strange or mysterious about this? And why is this such a big deal? The answer is found in our second key. Ezekiel was not writing for his day. An overview of the book shows that Ezekiel was describing a time of great trouble for all of Israel. This trouble would come upon them because of their sins and would eventually lead them into military defeat and captivity. But here's the rub. The house of Israel had already been defeated and led into captivity 130 years earlier. So the question is, what good is a warning that comes 130 years too late? This is why our second key is so important. Ezekiel was not writing for his day, but if not then, when? As with so many prophecies of the Bible, there is a smaller former fulfillment that is a type of a much greater future fulfillment. That greater fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecies is yet ahead of us, and believe it or not, this will matter to you. The house of Israel eventually came out of captivity and migrated away from the Middle East. They are often referred to as the lost ten tribes of Israel. But history and the Bible reveal that they are not lost. They have to be somewhere in existence on earth today, and they are not the tiny Middle Eastern Jewish state called Israel. For sure, Jews are Israelites, but they are not the ten-tribed house of Israel, which was given promises of great agricultural and mineral wealth at the time of the end. As shocking as it may sound, the British descended and American peoples, along with a number of nations in Northwest Europe, make up these ten tribes. This is Ezekiel's true audience. Ezekiel was never able to personally take God's message of individual and national repentance to the house of Israel. But he recorded a strong warning for someone in a future generation to carry it to his intended audience. This can only happen if someone understands who these people are. And the ones who do understand will be held accountable for delivering that message. As we are told in Ezekiel, the 33rd chapter, and verses 7 through 9. 
So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. The sins of the American and British descended peoples are a stench in God's nostrils. Our sexual sins, drug use, violence, and rejection of God are bringing us to disaster on a scale never before known. The prophet Jeremiah speaks of this time ahead in these terms. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble. The book of Proverbs gives those who understand these things this warning in chapter 24, verses 11 and 12. Deliver those who are drawn toward death, and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? We have discovered two essential keys on today's program that unlock the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel's message was for the house of Israel, and Ezekiel was not writing for his day. Simply put, he recorded a message for our generation. Now this subject is far too important to cast it aside. If what I've said today is true, and it is, your very future and that of your children and your grandchildren will be affected. Don't believe it because I've said it. Believe it because you take the time to prove it for yourself out of the pages of your very own Bible. Now to help you prove these things, we have a booklet, The United States and Great Britain in Prophecy. There you will find much more biblical evidence than I've had time to cover on this program that identifies who these people are and what's ahead for them and for the world. And if you have already proven these things, what are you doing about it? Will you sit on this knowledge or get involved with others who are actively proclaiming Ezekiel's message to the people it was intended? You have a choice. And remember, procrastination is a decision. Be sure to come back next time at the same time and station where Richard Ames, Wallace Smith, and I will continue to share with you the teachings of Jesus Christ, the good news of the coming kingdom of God, and the exciting end time prophecies and their meaning. See you then. To view the Tomorrow's World telecast or request today's free offer, visit us online at tomorrowsworld.org. Remember to find us on Facebook and be sure to follow us on Twitter. The preceding program is produced by the Living Church of God.